Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another installation of our Chicago Studies Data in Dialogue series. The first, uh, which took place on the 14th of October, focused on the Chicago Data Portal. This one will focus on Chicago's Media Burn Archive, which is a, a nonprofit video archive that houses documentary footage from the last several decades of the history of our city often from articulating voices and perspectives and angles on the life of the city that, that don't get a whole lot of air, frankly, in sort of mainstream media or, or in, in published sources. Um, the Data and Dialogue series aims to offer its participants a behind the scenes look at data sets that can inform our understanding of the city um, and that can also inform the research that we're able to do and the teaching that we do about the city. Uh, the ways that we construct our knowledge, the kinds of sources that we consider are, are really important to the conclusions that we come to. And, and so we think it's important to elevate across the college a sense of the resources that are available across the city of Chicago and that, that can help us to explore new sources and therefore perhaps come to new conclusions and imagine new futures for our city. All of the sessions in this series uh, are aimed to open critical conversations with Chicagoans who make decisions about data in all of its different forms and in all the stages of its life cycle from collection to curation to publication to representation. I'm really excited to welcome today Sarah Chapman, a graduate of the college in 2004, who's the executive director of the Media Burn Archive. I'm gonna hand it over to Sarah now so that she can present uh, about her work and also about how she got to that work. Thanks so much for joining us today, Sarah. Thank you so much for, for inviting me. Um, I'm really excited to talk with you all today. Um, and I am going to share my screen. I have a little slideshow. Uh, there we go. And okay, I think I'm all set. And just let me, uh okay got it okay so uh this is my first slide um since chris already sort of explained what media burn is pretty well um this I, this is sort of the start of my university of chicago journey and where i was and how i got here a little bit so i um in high school was a huge physics nerd i loved physics especially astrophysics and math and I spent sort of my high school time like, sorry, I'm trying, okay. Um, <laughs> I'm just a little distracted by how to, technical issues. Anyways, um, so I spent my, um, my high school time really like thinking about the big issues of like the universe and what is it like and reading Carl Sagan, that's the guy on the right, Carl Sagan and Richard Feynman and all these people and just sort of dreaming of the day when I was gonna be the one where my job was gonna be to like think about these big questions. And I, and I my um, AP physics teacher in high school went to University of Chicago and he was like, University of Chicago is the place for you. I know this is exactly gonna fit you. And I had visited some other colleges like with my parents, um, kind of randomly selected, re recommended by um, a family friend who was a guidance counselor. And I'd visited these places and I always just felt like, I don't know, I just felt uncomfortable. Maybe it was just because I was nervous about the idea of going to college, but I went to the, I visited the University of Chicago and it was just the first place that I was like, this is it. I love this. I want to be here. I want to be around. I want to be in these buildings doing, you know, carrying all my books and going to the library. Um, and so I applied early and that was really the only place I considered and, and, and went there and I became a physics major with an astrophysics uh, concentration, I think it was then or something. Um, and so I spent three years doing astrophysics and um, this group of sort of dorky looking people on the bottom left were my um, colleagues in uh, working for Professor Don York, um, who's, who's the, um, the guy second from the left. Um, and we all worked with Don York studying either diffuse interstellar bands or quasars, depending on our team. And um, it was during these three years that um, 
I didn't have time to take anything other than the, the core classes and my physics and math stuff because it's, you know, you need to take them all in sequence. And so your schedule's really, really full. Um, and so I spent these years doing all those physics and math classes and then working for Don York and working as an astrophysics research assistant basically involves being in some kind of a basement computer. I know they just tore down that building and maybe that maybe the, they're not working in the basement anymore. But back then we were all in the basement using like computers that were 20 years old, writing our own little computer programs um, and just sort of analyzing data. That was my job. Basically, Don would apply to um, telescope time and he would get um, a bunch of data that and then me and the other research assistants would sort of refine the data in order to sort of like solve this this larger issue. But so through that research, I realized that the work of being an astrophysicist isn't really, or for almost everyone, isn't really just sort of like being like Carl Sagan right there, sort of like thinking about the universe and just having these grand thoughts. It's really just sort of plugging away at data analysis um, so that eventually, you know, after many, many years, you publish a paper and it, and it provides a tiny little new detail for the other astrophysicists um, and advances science that's just this tiny, tiny little bit. Um, and that was okay, um, but I was less excited about it and, because it was just, you know, a little boring and there was a long road ahead of me, um, you know, with the process of thinking about going to grad school and, and um, becoming a professor and all of that. Um, but so my third quarter of my third year, I finally had time to take an elective, like a real elective, not just like the social and human stuff. And I enrolled, I, I sort of, I don't even know how I picked this, but I enrolled in Judy Hoffman's documentary film class. And um, I was so inspired by Judy and so fascinated by the subject matter. And I realized that what that there was an, an option where what you did was interesting all the time. Like the whole, the whole time it was interesting. Like while you're watching a movie, it's interesting. Afterwards, it's interesting thinking about it, writing about it, talking about it with other people. There's no like long delay till you get to the interesting part uh, where you make a discovery. You're sort of making little mini discoveries all the time in terms of, you know, your understanding of the world such and such. So I um, just dropped physics and I became a cinema major, cinema studies, cinema and media studies. Um, and I did that in my remaining four quarters. I basically just took all cinema studies for those four quarters and I graduated on time. Um, but to move on from that, I guess the thing that inspired me the most in Judy's classes was learning about this movement called the guerrilla television movement. So um, this was a time when um, this new technology of portable videotape became available to the public. And this is a uh, sort of wacky hippie guy on the right holding, holding a, the cam he's holding one of those cameras. Um, this was around 1967 or so, late 60s, when these, this um, equipment became available. And it was a confluence of a technological breakthrough alongside a, um, just a real moment of social change around in the US and around the world that caused this to be a very interesting movement um, to me. Um, so the to refresh those of you who you know weren't alive then, like uh, me, uh, television in the 1960s was incredibly powerful. You didn't have the internet, TV was just sort of like the main way everyone got their information. It was so powerful, and there were only three networks. Um, you can see I put pictures of one, a camera from one of each, CBS, NBC, ABC. So with only three networks on television and most people tuning in every night, whatever one of these three sets of individuals had to say was extremely powerful. Um, the other reason that I put these pictures in is to show you what TV, oh, it says sharing is paused. Can you still see my screen? Oh, I don't know what happened. Okay, it just kicked me out, but great. <laughs> um, so TV production could only be done inside a studio. These cameras were the only way to make TV. So you can imagine what the content that got produced was very limited to you know, a, a, a news anchor sitting at a desk talking about stuff. Um, sometimes they would use some film cameras and go out and shoot some on location footage, but primarily 
TV was made in a studio by the people who had access to this very bulky, large, expensive equipment. And only a few people were really involved in making it. You know, as you've seen in these pictures, it was mostly white men. Um, there were unions that sort of controlled who could be involved. Um, and there weren't opportunities for people of color, for women. Um, you know, all sorts of people's voices were not really part of creating the narrative that was being told to the whole uh, country on television. Um, and what these new cameras enabled was the idea that everyone was going to be able to make television. Um, these are some ads for the equipment when it started coming out. And as you can see, it is showing ordinary people using it, um, like this lady, um, this fashionable lady, and also um, sort of ex emphasizing the extreme idea of being able to go anywhere. This guy's up in a tree making, making TV or making video. Um, if you ever take Judy Hoffman's class, I think she will just hammer this in that back then, like TV and video were the same thing. TV was video, video was TV. They were not separate things yet. So the idea really was these people um, get, got this equipment and their goal was let's teach, let's, let's buy this equipment, create ways where people in the community can borrow it and access it and start making their own television. Let's train them how to make television. Um, and they had this vision for a future where we were all going to be communicating via television. There were going to be hundreds of channels on the television and there was going to be just every single thing under the sun, you know, that um, maybe there would still be those three corporate channels, but then there would be a, a channel for, you know, people who are knitting or there's a channel for, um, you know, community organizers in Philadelphia, whatever, you know, whatever it is that we were all, that we all now had this opportunity to be on equal footing with those people who had controlled um, the media in the past. And the thing that was, I was most drawn to and really excited about was how women really got into this movement and um, picked up cameras. Um, both in like Hollywood filmmaking, you know, so, so few women had been behind the camera um, by the 19 by the 1960s or 70s, and still even up until recently, so few women were doing that. So few women had been involved in TV production, even in experimental film. Um, women had been very, very underrepresented, and there was a huge push um, to get women involved and creating, having their stories told, and being able to tell different stories um, than the people who. Um, have been creating TV, we're telling, tell stories of communities, different communities. Um, and so that's why I got really excited about it, was, was um, really inspired by these women and especially people like, like Judy herself, who I didn't put her picture in, but she was um, also very involved um, in all of this. And so anyways, I decided to write my so there, at the time, there had been written basically one book about this guerrilla television movement. But since then, there's been more. But the first was this book written in the late 90s by Deirdre Boyle called Subject to Change, Guerrilla Television Revisited. And she told the story of several groups around the country that were working in this movement. Um, it was primarily groups, actually, that picked up this equipment because it was a bit expensive. Um, it was a, an era where people wanted to work in collectives. But it also, this equipment just made sense um, to, to be bought by excuse me, bought by groups rather than individuals. Um, so she had written about several of the most significant groups on the East and West Coast, um, but there, no one had yet told the story of Gorilla Television in Chicago. And um, Judy taught us a, a lot about that in her class. She showed us videos by people from Chicago who were making important work. And I sort of realized that this history, like, there was only a limited time left to tell it, you know, basically the lifespan of the people who were part of it because um, it lived in their memories. Um, their, all of their footage was on these um, old deteriorating videotapes that were only gonna last for a certain period of time. And no one had been able to see these tapes um, outside of like during the era, you know, like in community centers, galleries, maybe a limited amount of public television or something. But this was basically just a movement that had happened and been very innovative and exciting and had, was kind of just forgotten. You know, if you hadn't lived through it, very few people knew this had happened. Like my parents didn't know this happened, for example. Um, 
so I decided to that I, that my BA thesis was going to be like sort of writing the history of guerrilla television in Chicago, and it um, was a good topic for me because I, as I mentioned, only had a couple quarters of of cinema studies, so I didn't have a lot of that theory yet, and this was mainly a sort of historical paper. Um, so, anyways, um, when I just decided to write this work at the same time Judy happened to invite this guy Tom Weinberg to her class to speak to us and Tom had been um, a very important figure in this movement in Chicago for and nationally for decades and coincidentally he had a, he had collected and assembled something like 4,000 tapes of work by him and his colleagues and he um, had rented a storefront in Old Irving Park and sort of put the tapes there with the idea that sort of what he saw, this was uh, late 2003, early 2004, um, being part of this visionary group of people in the 1970s who had wanted everyone to have, they, they worked for decades to make it so that everyone could communicate through television, everyone could create media and send it to other people. Um, that didn't happen, obviously, through television, but in the early 2000s, Tom started to see like, wait a second, I think the internet is going to be that thing, you know, and it's obvious now, but it was very radical in the early 2000s. I mean, YouTube didn't exist yet. Um, when we were trying to raise funds to build our website, um, first of all, there were, it wasn't, there were no templates for this. We had to have web developers like actually build everything about the technology. There were no services you could use. Um, but and when we were doing this, the comment we most often faced was like, but people aren't going to watch video on the internet. Like, it's just too small. It's not fun. It, you know, it's just like, it's just not something we're going to do. And what Tom and I were saying was like, yeah, they are. They're They're going to watch video on the internet. Just wait. Like, and, um, obviously that, um, has come true. But so, so, um, I needed to see these tapes that he had. He was really the only connection. I, so I, I conducted a lot of interviews with some of the video makers that I was writing about, but he was really the only person who had tapes that I could watch. And I wanted to see the tapes. And so um, he said that he wanted to start an archive. And I was like, well, I'll, I'll start coming around and helping with that. Um, so th because I want to see the tapes and make sure that um, other people can see them. So um, while I, during that, you know, winter spring 2004 my final year i was coming around and starting to help with this um and um i finished my thesis and then after i graduated i just uh stayed on and we figured out how to you know create an archive um which involved for just a few years of just simply like like organizing the tapes putting numbers on them building a database, you know, building the website. Obviously there were other people involved. We didn't single-handedly do all of these tasks, but um, yeah, so time has just passed and this collection continues to be something that I personally feel is just underseen and like super, super important. Um, and as, as time has passed and we've been able to make these collections available, it's been really, really exciting for me to see that um, we have put people into the, the canon of media art that weren't there before. Um, this, in particular, this woman, Anda Kors, who was a really pioneering um, journalist and um, documentary producer in the 1970s. She was really thinking pretty expansively about the potential of video um, to be used for, for journalism and other purposes. And, um, did some really exciting work, but she died, I think, around 1991. And um, aside from people who worked with her during the 70s, obviously she really had been forgotten. And um, one of the first like collections outside of Tom's original stuff that we got donated to us was um, her daughter donated a few hundred tapes of Anda's work. And we were able to write grants and get them digitized and put them online. And you know now something like, I don't know, 12, 13 years later, um, she is taught routinely in classes on video art in Chicago, you know, at the, the School of the Art Institute, other places. Um, you can find a lot of references to her online and like literally none of that existed before we digitized this collection. And it's really exciting and important to me that, you know, that used to be maybe if you thought of important video artists, you thought of Nam Jung Paik and, um, you know, you got this list of a few people and now like on the course is for a lot of people sort of in there. And sort of being able to change that history of who is important 
is just really, really exciting to me. And it's what motivates me to want to keep getting more collections, make more collections available. Um, I think I went on a little bit of a tangent from my slides. This was um, just a view of our early group. This is uh, right when the bean was um, built. We, we went there and we took a picture. This was our sort of co-conspirators. Um, and so fast forward to today, uh, both Tom and I are still involved. Um, I'm now the executive director and he um, continues to be the board chair. Um, and this is our office that we used to go to, <laughs> don't anymore. Um, we, we do have one archivist who still goes into the office um, to digitize tapes. You can sort of see a lot of this complicated equipment um, that he needs to use and he's got to do it there. Um, but um, we used to do some events there. This, this picture on the left is a picture of an exhibit we created um, called Studs Place, which relates to a, a very important Chicago um, broadcaster, oral historian um, named Studs Terkel, um, who if you don't know about, you should, you should learn about because he's a really amazing Chicagoan. And he, his, he really was one of the first people to champion the idea of telling history through the stories of ordinary people. That history had been told as a series of um, stories of sort of great men, you know, these, these individuals who were thought to have made a big um, contribution. But what Studs did through dozens, I don't know how many, 20 or 30 books of oral history, was tell the story of history through the stories of ordinary people through their lived experience. Um, and Tom was um, very much inspired by Studs um, and sort of thought of his work as doing what Studs did in video. Um, and Studs partnered with Tom on that. Tom, I mean, Studs totally signed on to that idea. He was, we have a video that always excites me of Studs in the 1970s, hanging out with Nelson Algren, a very important Chicago author, and telling Nelson Algren the video was like the future. The video was just gonna be this, this thing that did what he did. Um, Sorry, I've got a lot of cat interference, but um, so Studs is, is very much sort of like a, a, a model, important model for our collection um, and, and a lot of the philosophy behind it. And so we created this Studs Place exhibit because we also have um, about 300 tapes with Studs Turkle. Um, I know there are several collections of Studs Turkle stuff, but what ours is that's different, distinct from what's at the History Museum or WFMT is that ours is footage like of studs in action. It's like not footage of his, um, his shows, recordings of his shows, it's um, him being in documentaries basically, or on TV shows. And about half of that footage came from a collaboration that Tom and studs had for many years. They produced many TV shows together. Um, and the other half just came from um, Studs' house. He donated his collection to us, um, which were basically like every time he'd appear on a show or in a documentary, he'd get a copy of it. So when he was um, in his final years, he asked us to come over and take those tapes away. So we um, have a really great representation of Studs, the person, um, as opposed to like Studs, the oral historian or Studs, the radio DJ. Um, so you should check that out. And um, yeah, we we sort of like Studs Place was um, his, a TV show that he um, was part of in the uh, early 1950s. Um, <laughs> and we those little, um, that, that stack on that table right there is the kinescopes of that TV show. Um, kinescopes were film recordings because of like taken off of a screen because TV was totally live in that era. So it would only be recorded if someone made a kinescope of it and sort of sent it across the country for time shifting usually. Um, anyways, enough about that. So um, we, here's just some examples of some of the collections that we have. Um, we've got about 8,000 videotapes and there's a wide variety of topics. Um, the unifying um, feature is really that it was made on video as opposed to film. Um, and it was made outside of commercial contexts by people who cared about the subject they were um, looking at. Um, so Her Harold Washington, um, Chicago's first uh, black mayor. We have a lot of Harold Washington footage. Um, he was, he's definitely worth 
uh, watching. He's, he was very charismatic and interesting. Um, the 1992 election, um, we have a ton of footage of that, um, several hundred hours as part of a program that Tom produced called the 90s. Um, they were they were able to follow all of the candidates very intimately, you know, from Clinton to Jerry Brown to George Bush to Perot to, um, you know, all of the, the people who were in the primaries like Sangus and whoever. Um, and since they what they were producing was um, not news, it was not going to air until after the election. They were giving very, very close access to the candidates who ordinarily would want wouldn't be able to wouldn't want that material made public. It was sort of viewed as being for posterity rather than for news. So they've got a lot of footage with um, Rahm Emanuel, who was a Clinton fundraiser, George Stephanopoulos, James Carville, all those people who went on to be very, very um, influential in politics in subsequent decades. Um, so yeah, there's there's a wide variety of things. So there's, there's a lot of sports, there's um, Chicago characters. Um, a couple collections that I'm gonna highlight, um, just to give you an example of how the footage can be useful. Um, so one of the first collections that I personally like watched and cataloged way back in 2004 or five or whatever um, was about 50 hours of footage shot to make this documentary about Vito Marzullo. So one thing that we have in our collection that's different than a lot of other archives is in addition to a completed documentary program or TV show, we also have all the footage that was shot um, to make that program because we look at that as really, you know, moving image primary source material, as close as you can get um, to something that's unfiltered. Obviously, someone turned the camera on, someone pointed it in a certain direction, but it's as close as you can get. Um, and it often also allows you to understand the biases because you're gonna hear what people are saying. You know, you're gonna hear someone prompting um, an interview subject, et cetera, all the stuff that gets cut out, sort of made invisible in, in a finished program. So, this collection was about Alderman Vito Marzullo. Um, it was in 1978. And Alderman Marzullo was just the epitome of a Chicago machine politician. He ruled his ward. He had been in office for 35 years or so and was one of the most powerful people in the city at that point besides the mayor. And so this footage um, featured Vito both at home um, as well as you know in his ward office at city council meetings and it was through watching this collection that I really came to understand like the power of this footage because I would be watching you know 10 hours 12 hours of footage of Vito in his ward office and um, you don't th what you learn is sort of all this intangible stuff when you watch all that footage I learned like how did people address him when they came in? You know, you saw the power dynamics between certain people who came in and addressed him differently. Other people didn't have a lot of power. You saw like what he said to his aides in between meetings. You saw just like, how was the room decorated? Um, how did people dress? What kind of accents did they have? All this stuff that you couldn't get from like reading a, um, you know, even a journal, you know, like a diary about it um, or reading letters or reading newspaper articles just this sense of what the space was like and how people interacted with it just like made me understand Chicago politics in a way that I couldn't have learned any other way. Um, I highly recommend checking it out. It was, a, it, it was a fascinating period for Marzullo because his ward, he was, a, he was an Italian immigrant. His wife is an Italian immigrant. Um, his ward had been Italian for almost his, his entire career and it had just sort of shifted to um, there being a lot of, um, especially Puerto Rican families moving in and the Italians moving out. And so he was presiding over this ward where his constituents no longer were like him. Um, so it was a very, very interesting collection. And I guess I just wanted to say that, um, more and more, I think researchers need to think of um, moving images as as source materials for research because you can learn so many different things and so much more than you can learn from just those traditional research sources. Um, so just another collection is the uh, Voices of Cabrini collection, which is also um, a very large collection. Um, from a few different productions, mostly from uh, Ronit Vezalel's Voices of Cabrini that was shot in the, the 90s, but also some earlier stuff from the 80s. 
And um, again, this is a way to access a place that does not exist anymore. You know, you cannot go to Cabrini Green and, and see what it was like, but you can use these videos to go inside and see what the units were like, see what the hallways were like, hear from the residents and sort of it's close as you can get to understanding what public housing was like um, through accessing these, these videos. Um, and these are just two examples of the many, many things that you might be interested in um, that is in the collection. Um, so I wanted to transition to talk about the ways that, that people have been using the collection. Um, and one way, um, so I've been sort of yammering on about the camera originals, but um, this was a, a project we did with Skidmore College. Um, so with the, the film, Howard Zinn, You Can't Be Neutral in a Moving Train, Howard Zinn was um, a very important um, thinker um, and historian who, like Studs Terkel, really championed the idea of telling the stories from the ground up, telling the stories of ordinary people and not the stories of the extraordinary people. Um, and so Deb uh, Ellis and Dennis Mueller made a documentary in 2004 about Howard Zinn. And as you can, it was a feature film. And as you can imagine, it was, you know, 90 minutes or whatever, but they had I don't know, 80 hours of footage that they shot. And they shot interviews with all of these really great um, 20th and 21st century thinkers. And, you know, like they had, they had studs, of course, they had um, Noam Chomsky, they had Ellis Walker, all of these great people. Um, they shot probably two hour interviews with them, but maybe they used 20 seconds in the documentary. And so we really look at that as just sort of unused primary source materials. And so we worked with this class at Skidmore College. Um, Deb and Dennis were so generous and excited to give them access to this footage to really be the first people ever besides the two filmmakers to, um, to view this footage and, and to use it to create original research. Um, Deb and Dennis were generous enough to realize that although they had certain purposes for the footage when they shot it, other people would have new purposes. And so these, these students actually got to create totally new um, videos, um, create, you know, had their, their own theses, whatever, uh, based on this footage that no one had ever seen before. Um, and so there's a, a link to look at that stuff if you want down there. And um, we're hope, excited to do more of that in the future, which I don't know if I put a slide, yeah. So our, the next one collection that we're hoping to do that same thing with is a collection of footage about the 1963 Chicago Public Schools boycott, which was shot by, um, uh, there's a film called 63 Boycott um, created by Cartemquin Films, who hopefully you know about. They're a Chicago-based production company that's been around for more than 50 years. Um, Gordon Quinn, um, the co-founder, co was a U, U Chicago alum, and um, he actually shot footage in 1963 of this boycott. Um, he, there, there was a minor story that went around um, a few years ago that he actually ended up with footage of Bernie Sanders um, protesting at University of Chicago in 1963 that they found in this footage that of course he didn't know because he didn't know Bernie Sanders in 1963, he was just a guy. Um, so that's one of the exciting things that can happen with saving archival footage. But at any rate, this was a um, one of the largest Northern civil rights demonstrations. More than 250 students um, boycotted school in order to protest the extreme segregation in CPS. And so Gordon shot this footage in 1963. And then in 2013, when the um, Chicago public schools were shutting down a lot of schools and there were renewed protests, Gordon realized that it was time to make to use this footage and to to shoot new footage and make a film about it. So he went and with the uh, with um, several other uh, producers, one of whom Tracy Matthews is in the Center for Race and Scholarship or whatever at UChicago. Um, they um, made this. They went and interviewed um, people who were a part of the organizing the boycott and uh, parents of students and students who participated, and made this film called Sixty Three Boycott. And similar to Deb and Dennis, Gordon and Tracy and Rachel, the producers, they also thought like, it's a shame that we shot so much footage and like only a half hour of it gets to be seen by anyone. Like this should be used by, by students and researchers. And they're really excited about making that available for other people to, um, 
to use to make to make new um, programs. So there is a digital exhibit um, at Chicago Collections Consortium. You can check out if you want. Um, it was created by six University of Chicago students over the last year. Um, and then at this URL here, mediaburn.org slash 63 boycott, you can see all of the all of the footage, all of these interviews and stuff. And we hope that it will um, be a research source for, for people. And um, oh yeah, I wanted to talk about our project this summer um, to document life under COVID-19. We had um, three University of Chicago students and two high school students documenting life all around the country and the world. Um, Zheng Ying was in China. Um, the rest were scattered around the US. Um, and these students, uh, let's see, Zheng Ying had a summer links internship from U Chicago. A Levi was on a Metcalf and Ariana was on a uh, work study. So there's that, that's sort of some of the ways that students get involved with working with us. But so they, their job this summer was to just go out and document life and sort of like their perspective on this summer. And we sort of think that this is extremely this is an extremely important moment to document and understand and in the future, um, it's gonna be super worthwhile. Um, I know I'm kind of going long, so I'm gonna try to, oh yeah, I think I'm almost done. Okay, so one of the other things that we've done that's been very exciting is work with artists to um, use our footage to create new works. So in 2016, um, there were, we were all thinking and talking about how Russia had manipulated our election and we were talking about fake news and so on and really thinking about russia as this sort of like menace to us that you know that russia hadn't been sort of since the 80s and simultaneously at media burn we um sort of think of our role as keepers of truth and we're continually trying to edit footage that shows like um this is happening now here's the background you know just like constantly hammering in on like Truth, truth, truth. But we thought it would be really fun to instead do the opposite and invite some Russians, you know, like our enemy, to manipulate our media and to use our collection um, to create um, new pieces that specifically consider fake news and consider media manipulation and sort of lay bare the mechanisms of it. Um, so we had two American filmmakers and two Russian filmmakers. Those are the four people in the front row in the bottom picture. Um, and they collaborated to make a found footage film based totally on our collection. Um, and it's, it's pretty interesting. It's called Ghost in the Machine. And um, I put a link to where you can watch both the film as well as um, Zoom discussions with the filmmakers. Um, it premiered in St. Petersburg in 20, was it last year? I think it was, <laughs> time is a little weird for me, but I think this was just last summer. <laughs> this was 2019. And so we went to St. Petersburg and we screened it at three different venues, including this beautiful hundred year old film studio called Lendock. It was sold out. You can see from the audience full of, of people. I don't know why they came, but it was really exciting to get to um, screen it in St. Petersburg and talk to all these Russians who really wanted to to sort of, explain themselves to us and to hear for us to explain ourselves to them um, because there's so much you know there's such disconnect between our two populations but the thing that was striking to me is um one thing that um might come up in conversation that with between us or whatever is like oh you know my uncle in kentucky he just watches fox news 24 7 and he's got all these wacky ideas he's living in this other framework he's totally different facts you know and the russians would raise their hand and they'd say the equivalent they'd say you know i got an aunt in siberia she just only watches state media um in russia that's sort of their issues They're, they've got a propaganda sort of state-run media um and all she watches is that and that's the only place she gets her information and she's got these wacky these wacky ideas and um we both of us we're all dealing with that you know we're dealing with the same exact thing about um people in our families people we know being manipulated um by incorrect information and um i expected russia to be like super weird and it was you know it, it was they were like us i guess was kind of the exciting thing they weren't really um i didn't see a lot of like um you know thugs and and tracksuits 
going around, <laughs> at least not coming to um, experimental film screenings. Um, but so at any rate, that was one of, I think, the most satisfying things we've done. And we really want to do this with China um, once the world gets back to normal, because China is just another country where there's so much room for um, understanding and collaboration. And we were in talks with some filmmakers there before this happened, but um, in a, maybe in a, next year or the year after. So I wanted to point out our series of virtual talks with video activists. Um, these are um, platforms for us to start thinking about the um, role of media to change society. And so they're free. They're about an hour, hour and a half sometimes on Zoom. And we've been bringing um, video makers from around the U.S. as well as around the world. We're really excited to um, be sort of that the pandemic has given us the opportunity to um, expand our audience beyond just people who happen to live near us. Um, so we, we did a, a talk with some Brazilian video activists. Um, we got one coming up with Engage Media in the Philippines and sort of able to think about ourselves as a global community of people who are working with media to create change. Um, and we're really excited to be able to be part of that ongoing discussion. Also. So you might be interested in um, hearing from the Southside Home Movie Project on um, December 3rd, um, also a University of Chicago uh, project and primary source for you. So yeah, that's just uh, links to things, uh, follow us and I will just stop talking so we can, um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen actually so I can see the chat. That was my difficulty at the beginning was, uh-oh. Oh, there we go. Um, not being able to see the chat. Um, okay, so yes, Evan asks, um, are the videos transcribed? Yes. To what extent is the content tagged, coded, indexed? Um, I'll answer that first. So one thing that we knew when we were starting this is that video is not accessible unless it has a lot of metadata. And especially given that our collection involves very long programs, you know, with camera originals and stuff, tapes are an hour, they're two hours, and people on the internet don't want to watch two hours, they want to watch the part that they need. So everything is um, described in great detail with time-coded um, descriptions, so you can be searching and you find that you want to hear about uh, there's an interview with Stud Circle where for two minutes he talks about the possibility of nuclear war. And you don't care about the rest of it. You just want to watch that nuclear war thing because that's what you're studying. You can do that. Um, and that takes a lot of time and human power. Um, we purposely don't provide just transcripts of the audio because we believe that audio transcripts can be very long and they often don't get at that high level um, con conceptual, um, conceptually the way that a person can do. You know, a person can say for these five minutes, um, Alice Walker talks about the feminist movement in the 1970s. Um, whereas if you actually heard the, just the, what she, you literally transcribed what she said, you might not, that might not come across, you know, for your search terms or whatever. So um, it's all described by humans and with time codes. And so it is very, um, it's in a very, it's something that we consider essential to the process of making available. And what advice do you have for someone going into a project that would involve say watching every episode of the nineties? What are your viewing strategies? Um, that's like a really good question. And it's hard because I don't know how you would go about that project because there are 52 hours of, of that show. Um, I guess the way that I tend to use the collection is through like searching things in, in the search bar, searching for, for topics, people, places that I'm interested in and finding videos that have that rather than trying to systematically watch everything in a series because it's probably going to be too much. I would say that Although everything is described very well, I'd say maybe a weak point is there isn't as much curation as I would like. There isn't like a page you can go to that's like, start here, here's the stuff. So I think the experience will be richest if you come to it with something you want to see. And I know that it's hard for you to know what we might have, but it might be like Chicago politics, very strong. If you start searching for, let's say, 
Jane Byrne, former mayor, or you know, even more obscure people like David Orr, um, you're going to find that stuff and maybe start start with that. Also, obviously, I would start with finished programs rather than camera originals, even though I um, have been talking them up so much. Um, that's really sort of a first place to start is those finished programs. So just just so I, I kind of kind of translate your answers to both of those questions, you're saying it's kind of kind of a combination of the two things like using search terms to identify roughly where in um, in a video or in a series certain topics are addressed that we're interested in, but then actually watching the whole thing in order to get uh, or at least watching whatever the, the several minutes surrounding wherever the timestamp with that um, text reference is in order to pick up all that nuance and all those other subtle cues. It's like a co combination of just watching it all, but also um, being pretty strategic and trying to um, narrow it down using some of the metadata. Yeah, I mean, I guess it, it probably just really depends on what, what you're researching, you know, like what, what your need is um, because um, there's so many different things in the collection. You might be looking at, you know, an interview or you might be looking at actual just documentary footage of an event um, or you might be looking at a like a produced program. Um, Chris suggested that I um, just sort of screen share a little bit of our website, which I think might help. Um, so I will do that. Um, so this is our homepage. And um, so in this, this is sort of the, the best, like the most curated section. Um, so you might look at the Chicago collection, for example, um, you can see a list of like maybe topics people contained and then there's some sub collections. Um, so like maybe you're interested in the Chicago conspiracy trial because you would just watch the new Aaron Sorkin film and you wanna see some, some primary sources. Um, <laughs> so like this, for example, is a press conference, um, with, uh, Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin and all those guys and William Kunstler and stuff, um, after one of the days of the trial. Um, but another thing that you might do is you might say like, I'm researching Carol Mosley Braun or something. And, um, so we have... A, Kind of a lot of her actually which is kind of interesting um so there's a whole variety of, of stuff um and yeah so there's also tags um so you might try you know once you find something you might have this 1992 election tag maybe that's oh not not a very used tag i guess that wasn't very useful um but one thing that we have that i need to check okay it needs to get added to this there is a tag for certain communities um if philosophies about about cataloging have changed over the years and when we were initially describing the videos i think you know, back 15 years ago, it seemed more egalitarian to sort of like not mention race when saying, you know, this isn't, you don't say this is an interview with a black woman, you just say this is like a person or this is a professor or whoever. But so much over the years, people come to us and they say, what, what footage do you have of African American communities? And we're like, oh, I guess we need to tag them and go back and read and change that. So I guess I didn't add it to here, but there is a, what is it? A, category um yeah so oh uh, at any rate i'll fix that i'm going to put a link here you should be able to find book uh videos about latinx communities uh lgbtq etc um so i i don't know if there are other questions in the chat right now somehow i'm not succeeding it um oh here blah 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 if yes okay so if a student wants to use footage from a video in your archive what's the process this is all considered public domain um no um all of the footage is in general owned by somebody who made it um 
So in general, if you're gonna be using this for um, research, it's probably fine, but if you're gonna be making a film, for example, you'd need to come to us and license it. I mean, we're very flexible and we, we know that um, if HBO or Showtime is making something, we're gonna charge them as much as we can get to, to support our work and to pass on to those filmmakers and support their careers because they haven't typically made a lot of money. But if you, um, you know, are making a film yourself, like we're gonna work with you to make sure that you can use it. Um, so it's, permission needs to be there, but in general, if you don't have any sort of commercial funding, we're gonna not, you know, really charge you for it or whatever. Um, and specifically for those Zinn and um, 63 boycott collections, it's very much the intention of the filmmakers that students and researchers reuse that content specifically for stuff like this. Again, not to make um, a feature film, you know, that makes a hundred million dollars, but to make something really important, you know, about a, some kind of research topic. Um, Southside Home Movie Project uh, made me wonder in what ways do you interact with other local video archives? Um, yeah, I mean, we interact a lot because we're part of a small group of, I mean, <laughs> all doing sort of the same thing. Um, we're really all in the same boat. I mean, we are close also with the Video Data Bank at the Art Institute um, because we're both collections of videotape. Um, I guess I don't need to be sharing my screen anymore. And um, so we collaborate a lot on issues of preservation, you know, sharing best practices for figuring out how to get your decks fixed. Um, all the, um, the preservation is, is very challenging because there've been several dozen video tape formats over the last 50 years and you need a different deck for each one and you need to keep all the decks working. Um, so, um, let's see. Is there a national collaborative of similar collections project? I'm thinking especially about Gorilla TV. Um, not, not really, unfortunately. Um, there are individual projects. Um, a really great one just popped up at the Berkeley Art Museum slash Pacific Film Archive, um, which is hundreds of uh, tapes from the group TV TV um, that you should check out. Um, they've made available all sorts of like, um, in addition to the videos, um, you know, documents and things like notes between the memos, things like that. Um, but we are actually working to create a national um, database of website um, featuring work from hundreds of, not hundreds, um, well, hundreds of different people um, from from seven different media art centers around the country. So we're, we're sort of hoping that will be something that exists in the future. At the moment, really, I think a lot of this material is, is fragmented, unfortunately, and you need to go to the each different groups to access it. Um, just in some sense, we think of MediaBurn as being, you know, one of those aggregators, because we weren't um, producing media in the 70s and 80s, and we were, we're, we've just collected the work of many different people and groups. Well, speaking about that, you, you spoke with a lot of pride about sort of the way in which MediaBurn has in, in your own little way kind of helped to get a few different filmmakers into the canon. Um, and I, I, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that. Um, like as, as someone who does this work and who's kind of uniquely positioned to do this, this work, um, I don't know, what, what do you find yourself thinking of? What are the considerations that, that you take sort of most seriously in attempting to help a filmmaker's work to become more known or, or canonized, if you will. Um, and what, what kinds of responsibilities do you feel as, in this case, like the, the leader of, of an organization that, you know, that is doing work that a lot of other places aren't doing or can't do? I think that it is important that although we both are sort of curators of what goes into Media Burn, to also sort of like not let our own biases of what is interesting or important um, prohibit things from being part of it or prohibit them from being, you know, promoted and, and, and shown. Like, I'll just give two examples of that. Um, one was a collection of footage that our founder, Tom Weinberg, had worked on. It was a, a, a pilot for the show about technology that, they, that he and this guy, Elon Soltis, wanted to make in the early 80s. And so they shot a bunch of footage um, at Apple computers, um, footage inside the Ms. Pac-Man factory, um, all this stuff. And, but they didn't end up making, no one picked up the pilot. They didn't make the show, but they had, you know, 
20 or 30 tapes that they had shot. And there was like a day when Tom brought them into the office and we like almost put them in the garbage because it was just like, this is just B-roll of something that never happened. Who cares? Whatever. But we didn't end up throwing it away and we digitized it. And this has been some of our most widely seen and requested footage ever. Like our most popular footage, this, this Ms. Pac-Man factory stuff. It was not interesting, important to me. I didn't, I don't really care about early video games or arcades. None of that didn't mean anything to me. To me, it was just, because it, it, it is B-roll. It is not produced into anything. It is walking around a factory. And to me, footage of walking around this factory is not useful, but boy, was I wrong. I mean, like, hundreds of thousands of people feel differently than me. So that's one example. And another example I think is um, there was a bunch of footage, not a bunch, but um, maybe 10 hours of footage shot with um, Joan Jet Black, who was a um, the drag queen, queen persona of a uh, local performer named Terrence Smith. And Joan Jet Black ran for president in 1992. This was very marginal. This, I mean, not many, you know, at the time, very few people were paying attention to this. It was, um, you know, it was like a political statement, but obviously not like a serious candidate. Um, her slogan was Lick Bush 1992, um, running against Bush. Um, so anyways, but we had this footage. And again, this always just seemed like kind of an obscurity um, to me. Um, but that's, no, that it's not. I mean, over the last 10 years or so, people have discovered that footage and it. We, there have been requests to screen it in film festivals and exhibitions all around the world. Hundreds of thousands of people saw it in um, a gallery ex exhibition in Mexico. Um, it was in Spain. It's been at five or six different film festivals in New York, San Francisco, uh, Portland or Seattle. Um, and eventually, recently, um, Steppenwolf made a play um, about, about Joan Jet Black. And this is a person or a, a historical figure who wasn't probably that appreciated outside of very small communities in 1992. But now in 2020 is is sort of being moved into like, oh, this is something that was important and we need to think about this. And we have a lot of footage and there wasn't a lot of, you know, not a lot of people were paying, you know, the news wasn't covering Joan Jet Black. Um, so that's just, again, an area where um, I need to be open to the idea that I don't know what's important to everybody and what and um, it's been a amazing just I mean it's screening right now actually at the uh, Parkway Theater uh, which is run by the Maryland Film Festival um you can check it out I think it's like eight dollars or something um there's this um it's going on right now like a maybe month-long virtual screening you can also check out the footage on our website though for free <laughs> but they curated a 65-minute program Here's one more question that Caitlin asked in the chat that I really like. Um, I'll just read. I'm sorry, Caitlin, if you're on, you're welcome to read it yourself. But you mentioned your COVID documentation project. Are there other current events or issues that you're exploring or want to explore more? How do you decide what content to prioritize when there is so much video content out there? I, I as you were speaking at the beginning, found myself thinking a lot, too, about this moment, which so much of the activism has been catalyzed by video. And I, I, I was thinking very similarly to, to Caitlin and wondering about that myself. Yeah, it's really, um, it is a challenge because we're very small. Um, we have two full-time staff and we always have a bunch of um, interns from University of Chicago, but, um, but yeah, we can't do a lot, everything. You know, we can only do a little, a little bit of stuff. So we do need to prioritize um, what, what is most important to us to be doing at the moment. Um, thanks, Evan. Bye. Um, and so a lot of what our priority is, is given that, um, we have this equipment to transfer this, um, these obscure obsolete videotapes, we kind of tend to mostly focus not on collecting or producing born digital content, but on right now, at least before all the videotapes and the, the equipment is gone, which might be in the next 10 years or so for, for now trying to collect and transfer as much of that as we can before it's totally lost. Um, so that's one, I know that's not a very, that, that still leaves so, so many things. Um, but the other thing that I wanted to say is that um, in this born digital era, I think given the fact that we are all documenting all the time, all of us have our own archive of videos and photos that we've taken, um, we, really think it's important to sort of emphasize that like YouTube is not an archive, like Facebook is not an archive, the internet is not an archive, and 
that archives need to be collecting materials for it to be saved in the long term. Like the likelihood that you are going to save and keep organized all of those photos and videos you've taken is just extremely unlikely. They're going to be lost at some point. Um, and so there's a very significant role for archives in collecting um, and saving material long term. Um, so, I mean, honestly, I guess just being pragmatic, how, what sets our priorities is very often funding. Um, what we can get a grant to do. That's sort of, the, <laughs> that's in some ways the way the nonprofit world works. Um, but we also prioritize which tapes are the most imminently in danger of being lost. Um, and yeah, what's gonna be interesting to people now? I mean, because we often collect things and we don't get to digitize them for a very long time because they don't fit into one of those things. Either there's funding or they're very endangered or it's something that people are talking about right now. Um, well, we're at the end of our hour, um, and so before anything else, thank you, Sarah, for your time and your care and for the autobiography, too, which I, I think has, has struck a lot of hope into the hearts of astrophysics majors everywhere that it is possible to do things that are interesting all the time. Um, which is a, a quote that I pulled away from all of this with a great deal of joy. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you to tell us quickly because this will go on our website. What are some ways that uh, UChicago students uh, can be directly supportive of the work that you do? Well, um, they should definitely attend our virtual events. Um, <laughs> we have one tomorrow with Salome Chasnoff, who was the um, founder and um, executive director of Beyond Media Education, which was a group that worked in Chicago for about 15 years to um, enable um, girls, women, people of color, LGBT community um, to teach them to uh, create media, to provide them with the equipment, um, so that they could tell their stories. Um, so she's going to be talking about her work with Beyond Media, um, as well as I think a little bit of her own video art. And that is in preparation for her donating the Beyond Media archive to Media Burn. So soon, <laughs> hopefully that will be available in the coming months as our University of Chicago interns uh, catalog it. Um, so we, I, we just filled up on interns um, for, for the year. Um, <laughs> There's been so much more interest now that um, the jobs are remote and um, it, it ha it's always been a barrier for UC students to necessarily have time to come from Hyde Park to the north side to do a job. But now that it's remote, we got an unprecedented amount of interest. But so definitely check back um, towards the spring. There's going to be people who are going to graduate or people who are going to do something else for the summer. We always have positions sort of usually um, when the academic year is ending and when the new one is starting, either for summer or the academic. Yeah, and um, so if you work study is the primary way we employ people, um, but if you don't have work study, really look into the Metcalf fellowships or the Summer Links program. Those are available to people who don't have work study eligibility. Um, and yeah, I mean, in terms of other ways to get involved, I mean, just you can watch our videos, use them for your research. Um, that's probably that's probably it. And feel free to email me if you have any questions and follow us on all of our things like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and stuff and YouTube. Yeah, and if, you, if you're if you not gonna make your um, slide deck available, please at least let me grab that one slide. I tried to screenshot it, but you were too quick um, changing. I wanna make sure that we, among other things, are following you guys so that we can promote the Beyond Media event in particular is ideal. I really wanna get that out. Sam, I, I know you said you had a question in the chat. Do you wanna voice it real quick? Yeah, um, first I want to say thank you, Sarah. Um, it's, it's been really cool. Um, I have a super specific question to um, one of my own uh, research um, projects. Um, I'm wondering whether there's a collection or a tag that's uh, specifically like home movies um, and just like any clips you have um, just about domestic um, spaces and architecture even. So it's interesting you ask that because I actually have been talking to a uh, researcher who is writing a dissertation on home movies and trying to get her access to stuff. So mm -hmm. in speaking to her like literally yesterday, I noted that we had a tag for home movies, but it hadn't been applied very widely. So okay. that's something I'm going to have the interns implement. But for the short term, I think if you just use the search terms home video, home movie, or even 
unrelated footage, um, you will find things. And then I'm going to work to get that tag implemented. The reason I say unrelated footage is very often the way a home movie appears in our collection, because it's mostly the work of like professional filmmakers. Um, often people will reuse tapes and so they will shoot their, um, the thing they went to mm -hmm. a protest, shot the protest, but then afterwards there's just other footage of their family or something. So often at the beginning or the end <laughs> of the tape, that's where you're going to find home movie footage. Cause it might just be them like getting ready at their house, testing their camera or whatever. Maybe it's a birthday or whatever it is. Right. So the search term unrelated that's awesome. might pr produce additional results. The okay. perfect of some art. That's amazing that that, wow, talk about found video. Um, Sarah, we have taken, uh, we have now taken over the amount of time that I told you we were going to steal from you. This is endlessly fascinating, and I look forward to many more collaborations. Uh, in particular, as I mentioned to you, it, I have a group of faculty who I think are very interested now in doing a uh, either a class or a quarter on the life and career of Harold Washington and Harold Washington's Chicago. And I, we, we need to talk at greater length than in another context about um, how Media Burn could be a part of that because I think it would be endlessly fascinating. Uh, the veto content also got me thinking about something we have coming up on Chicago politics. So many conversations to come. Speaking of many conversations to come for those who have joined us today, Chicago Studies uh, keeps going after this. Um, one of the things we're, we're going uh, a little bit older school than Media Burn, uh, our next data series or our next set of conversations concern the art of biography, actually going back to a time just before guerrilla television, looking first through a podcast episode at the life and times of Claudia Cassidy, uh, a trailblazing theater and music critic uh, in Chicago journalism. Uh, in the early to mid 20th century. Uh, we're following that up with a conversation with uh, historian and art, um, well, historian and biographer Nora Titone, who's now the dramaturg at the Court Theater, and uh, Will Hansen, who's an archivist at the Newberry Library, talking about the extensive collections of personal papers that are available throughout the city's archives. Um, another avenue into the, the private lives, and also in many cases, the professional criminal lives of, of great Chicagoans and, and uh, of the kinds of people that Howard Zinn or Studs Terkel would like to talk to too, um, ordinary Chicagoans who made things happen. Um, those conversations will be over the course of the next weeks. Uh, the next conversation in this particular series is actually going to do what we're calling the anatomy of a visualization. Uh, Nico Marcio from the Mansueto Institute for Urban Innovation is going to take a finished analytic visualization that integrates several different forms of data in a, uh, a spatial context in this case, and is going to backtrack to what that data began its life as and kind of look through all of the process of creating a finished analytic visualization, asking at each step of the way about the choices that are made and what those choices empower, but also what they exclude or preclude in a particularly social sciences research. Um, for more information about this and all sorts of other great things from Chicago Studies, visit our website, follow us on social media, and if you follow us on social media bonus, you will also be following Media Burn because we are following them. Thanks everybody so much. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, we'll talk to you soon.